so it's even like slightly a year. Okay. And we're live. It is Wednesday, October 13th. I'm running the show today. Did it get worse? No. Is that better? It's fine. It looks it looks about the same. Okay. <laughs> oh no. That is why it's laggy. Sorry, I have to mute the yeah. Uh, oh, fixed it. Okay, sorry. I was hearing myself through this YouTube. So just want to say this is episode five hundred and twenty eight. And yes, and yeah. we're still this is a oh you yeah, and we haven't fixed Bluetooth yet, Emily. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was just gonna say. I mean, uh, Ben's not here, but you're playing his role. Yeah, yeah I know. Ben, ben is... normally teases um, uh, Kate for yeah. things that are can could not possibly um, control. I, I think. Yeah. And to be quite uh, candid, yeah. it's not a real show unless we have a tech issue. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. I hope yeah. that I will not be the um, the source of the tech issue. <laughs> no, you're doing great. This is fantastic. Sometimes it takes us up to 15 minutes to bring guests <laughs> 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 yes. um, in. We are not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, we have Professor Emily Oster here to talk um, about her, her older book, uh, Expecting Better, and her new book, and to kind of talk about post-COVID childcare and everything that has been kind of happening as schools reopen uh, and people kind of go back to work. Um, and I am going to keep my monologue very brief and say that, uh, Emily, I found your work um, a number of years ago. And um, I think because of your initials and the start of your name and the fact that you're an economist, thought that you were Eleanor Ostrom's daughter. <laughs> like, okay. Um, like, and I was like, Oh, Eleanor Osram had a brilliant daughter. <laughs> Who also became an economist. And I uh, I went on that for like and I would refer to people like, have you read Emily Ostrom's book? <laughs> people would be like, No, I haven't. Anyways, so that was I'm an idiot. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> like, Do you know that my yeah. parents my mother is an economist? Which is like Oh a, really? Yeah, both my parents are economists at Yale. Um, oh. And so, actually, I do have economist, but just not that, not that economist. And I have her last name, so there you go. That's amazing! Hey. Oh my gosh, I love that that we found that out. Yeah, but what? it also, it, but it also explains the the. It also explains like your. I shouldn't say explains because, like, nothing is deterministic. But the fact yeah. that you run your house. It, it, the fact that the new book is about running the house like a firm, no, I mean, not the house, the home like the firm. Um, I was thinking that's such an unusual way to think about things. Like, did, how did you grow up? And so I guess that's the answer. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yes, I grew up two economist parents and my husband is economist. So it's like the whole thing is just like. Wow. Wow. So is it just like pure exchange for goods and or services? Like, it's not, I mean, that was like my whole childhood. You know? It was like, you could, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I, yeah. so, well, I mean, that explains something. Uh, <laughs> but not, we don't believe in determinism here. So not no, everything. No. Not everything. Okay. Uh, my brothers, I have two brothers and they are not economists. Oh, phew. Oh, God. <laughs> I was... But I saw the fear. Yeah. I saw the fear on your face with that. I feel like for a second, I was a little worried like, that this was going to be this going like a totally different direction. But let's have your parents on. We should have your parents on the show. Scott, track them down. Yes, yeah, Scott. They're not, they're not hard to find. My mother is at the business school. My father's at the economics firm. And at Yale, you know, you can just go, go find them, Scott. I, they're I, around. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I may leave the show early to do that. <laughs> go to their house and hello. They're probably so it was so I was gonna start with kind of like asking you to kind of tell the audience about uh like everything that kind of brought you into this. I'd forgotten your your parents and your background, but like if you could if you could kind of tell how you started working specifically in this area for everyone, 
Um, and I'm going to put links to your books in the chat for people um, as you kind of start, but just kind of give us an overview of how you got interested in this area in particular. Yeah, sure. So, um, so you know, I'm trained, uh, as, as we said, as an economist, um, and I, my, my sort of academic work is in like health, um, some combination of sort of, of health and health behaviors and statistical methods is kind of how I would describe it. So I'm sort of like in a sort of like somewhat technical applied economist who like does stuff about econometrics, but also stuff about health. And I like had a sort of pretty traditional, like I, I had a, I had a job, at, I got my PhD from Harvard. I went to University of Chicago and I was, uh, I was there um, for a while and then I, and then I got pregnant and I would sort of basically wrote Expecting Better, which is the first book, like because I was um, pregnant and I got all like, you know, into kind of the things that economists and data people like to do when they are experiencing something for themselves, which is like obsessively research it. And, and I think the sort of difference between my obsessive kind of data oriented research and everyone else's is that I also really like to write. And so I ended up kind of writing it and I really like the part of writing where you sort of try to translate for an for it's kind of like teaching but like you try to tr sort of translate for a lay audience and so my books are kind of like for they're kind of like they have a lot of data but the intention is that they would be also like fun um and sort of something between like a, a memoir and like a meta analysis kind of space and so i i wrote expecting better um and that actually came out my daughter is born in 2011 and the book came out in 2013 um and then things sort of like, I don't know, got complicated, I guess, is made one made it, way to put it. And um, and we were at Chicago at the time and, and yada, yada, yada. We don't work there anymore. And um, and now uh, we work Brown um, and I uh, and I love it. I love Brown. Um, and, you know, and then I wrote and then I had a second kid. And I wrote a second book and then I started a newsletter in like January 2020 and then my newsletter turned out to be all about COVID and so then the sort of last 18 months have been like a total like you know COVID insanity and I did a ton of work on schools and stuff about kids and COVID and schools and I wrote a third book which just came out so that's I don't know the last 18 months have been kind of crazy. So what is the average gestational period of your books? My books have taken one, basically one year to write, and then it's another year to come out. So I'm like kind of that's, in it. But, but I also have to like that, do other jobs. Like that's I, that's insane. incredible. That's not my job. That's insane, though. I mean, that's that's a greater productivity. I mean, you, you must really like to write because I really um, like to write. Yeah, yeah. But also that that you, you, obviously you're really talented at it because for it to come out in a year is. It's just extraordinarily difficult. Um, I like, uh, I really like to write, and I am a pretty fast writer. Um, wow. I really hate natural to Natural academic. A slow writer. Yeah. Um, I don't know. No. no, in my academic field, that's actually not at all like, like our writing is like, like when you write, the way that we write, like ag academic right. papers it's, in economics, being a fast at writing is worth nothing. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. my husband Ag is like the slowest writer on the planet Earth, and he's still like a tremendously more successful economist than I am because it doesn't actually matter that it takes him like nine hours to write every sentence because that's not like very important. Right. Because it's like, right. Because it's like boilerplate. Right? I mean, academic yeah. writing is boilerplate, especially in kind of social science -y things like they're just sections and they go there where you don't, you don't really have to be, and you don't actually want to be artful. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, at some point, my husband was reading one of the papers. He was like, I think your, hey, your papers are a little too clear. And I was like, yes. Well, I feel the opposite about your papers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but kind of piggybacking on his comment on your clarity, your books are very accessible to a lay person who's definitely not an economist and is not <laughs> in any way like situated to read an economist <sighs> paper. Um, do you find, did you find that there was a tendency to, um, especially with all the COVID stuff that you were putting out, kind of lean more heavily on your medical experience and like the data part there, or was it hard to keep it from getting too far in a narrative sense? 
it, this is always a balance yeah. um, because the way that I do all this work is basically I spend like a huge amount of time in the technical space and then I try to like back it, like sort of back it out into like, okay, like how can I sort of take this conclusion and give people enough that they know where it's coming from and that they can sort of access it without like, you, there's a sort of tension between like, trust me, I'm an expert. The answer is six. And like, <laughs> let me like, let me like show you all of the charts, like the 53 papers I read to get to the answer. And I think that's, I'm always, I'm always playing with that, with that tension in the books and in the, and in the COVID stuff. Um, I think you, that when Scott and I especially do the show, we get, we indulge a lot with academics on like their writing process and style. Cause I find right. it really fascinating to kind yeah, of know yeah. how people do this. And I think that it's like, I do a lot of empirical work <clears throat> and it's mostly qualitative, but, um, but like a lot of like what I do is reading all of the, like the literature behind it. And then all of the qualitative stuff that I've gathered on top of it and then putting them together into some narrative and no matter how I end up putting it, if I put it very clearly, I feel like there is a little bit of like, so where's the work? Like, what did you do? And I was like, like I no, think that, this is the gotcha of being good at explaining things. It's like, if you can synthesize I, I, everything down and make it accessible, you don't get any, you, people think yeah. that like, well, duh. Like we it's all just like stuff you think. Full time. Just like stuff, yeah. you just like you just saying stuff you think. It's like, I guess, but like I, no. yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, it's like um, in 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 the sense that if you're um, if if it's so clear that even you, the reader, can follow it, it can't be that complicated. Um, that 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 kind of like gotcha. Um, whereas, and I think that that is actually um, so. My thesis advisor, in when I was doing my PhD, said to me this is really clear it's too clear and just like just like your story but i said why did you just say that why is it too clear and he said because there are only certain people who whose understanding matters um and that is and so that there is like a kind of cult of esoteric um knowledge that happens in writing, um, and that's why you get all this jargon-filled stuff. Um, um, and there's a kind of way in which, when you write for a general audience, you want to show that you can actually use those words, but it's really quite counterproductive. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the jargon piece for me, like if, it, like that is the one thing that I, I, do like. I try so hard not to do. And I realize like there's actually a huge delta if you just take out the jargon. If you just like remove the jargon from your language, actually you already like it dramatically increase the clarity and it's fine. Like we have a shorthand, you know, when I'm writing for economists, they know what I'm saying. But I also think there's a sense in which when you're an academic, you kind of want to be like, oh, look at all these like giant words I'm using and like that you don't understand, you know, you don't understand. And like, there's like a gatekeeping aspect of it, which I don't. It's a signaling function. To yeah, for, yeah. Yeah, definitely. yeah. And I so, think when I I'm, like when I wrote the when I write the when I write the books, I have an, an editor, of course, um, at the, like I have a really amazing editor and and her sort of with the first book, I think like a like the whole first round was like jargon, 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 jargon. And I eventually <laughs> editor, like, in the third book, she had to like take out the jargon slightly as frequently. <laughs> it's like a big totally. You know. Um so I'm curious <clears throat> since you've written um uh your first book and kind of, and like, well, now that you've written three kind of all together, I'm also kind of curious, have you, what is when you go and give a speaking event or you do an interview, like what is the thing that like, if there's like young women that come up to you afterwards or men, actually I'd be very interested in kind of like gender split, but like, are there, is there one consistent thing that you hear a lot of besides like, thank you, God, God, thank you. like. Is there like, is there, I, I mean, I think, resonates? The, I think the biggest thing, and maybe this just resonates because it is the thing that makes me sort of the, the happiest, um, is the sort of like, feel like, like you let me control this situation, but like you let me like engage with the situation in a way that like I was more comfortable with. And I think that that, that's really what the, the first book in particular 
like I think gave people is like sort of in this moment of kind of being pregnant and feeling that people are just like telling you what to do and like you don't totally understand what is happening and there's a lot of things that people are just like, oh we're gonna do this the 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 flutal procedure and you're like oh I didn't hear about that before that it sort of gave people like a way to sort of say like okay I'm like I am I know what's gonna happen I have some sense of this I feel like I'm kind of in control of the of the information I think for a certain set of people that is that is really valuable. They, they, they felt empowered. They felt empowered. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I thought about you kind of mentioning that you were kind of OCD and turned to all of this when you were pregnant is a lot of my friends who have become pregnant, we've talked about this on the show before and Genevieve and I have talked about this separately, have um, women friends who have become pregnant have, and so some male, have, like there are two kind of, I feel like there's two camps and this is obviously anecdata, but like this is kind of this, there is this camp of like, you just will never understand what it is to kind of, what life is like on the other side of this thing. And you will never, like this thing being like having a child yeah. and like, and having kids. Um, and so you can't possibly experience my judgment in this like matter. You can't empathize. And then there are, and like, and kind of, there is a layer of, kind of crib sheet gets at it a little bit, which is like your second book, which is kind of like the people who use a lot to like, to take that anxiety and all of those feelings that they're having, try to rationalize or like, cause I have a lot of very smart friends try to like very much like stack up all of their like breastfeeding schedules and measure by the milliliter and like become very obsessive about like the actual pregnancy until they have their second kid and then suddenly stop caring as much. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> But, I, but I'm very, I'm kind of interested in like that. And then there's like, there are like a small number of people who like really do maintain their individuality quite a bit, like in having kids and do not become kind of like, I like I feel like a, they're not, they're wonderful parents. They just don't, like that's just not how they function entirely. And I'm just kind of curious, like if you've experienced that anecdotally, like in your time parenting and you also have like, I would imagine like similar friends to kind of like this group and like this kind of level of sophistication in education. So I wonder if that's, if there's any type of relation there. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, it's interesting. I think it's like the, people, I mean, people engage with their parenting really differently and at really different, you know, at really different ages. And I think also the, there is this sort of fundamental distinction about like sort of how much of my like like am i just a to people like i'm a to after you have kids you're a totally different person and like the extent to which you sort of embrace that or or agree with that or or whatever and i think there's like an intermediate like of course you're a totally different person but like are you like actually a like like how much of this is like, I'm going to totally change my life. And I'm going to like now be this, uh, like, this is going to be my central identity as opposed to like, this is going to be a piece of my, uh, of my identity that can like kind of both, both work, but they, it almost does feel a little bit like a conscious, like a sort of conscious choice about like, am I going to be like, hmm. I don't know how, like how encompassing are my kids gonna, um, gonna, gonna be. And I, I don't know. I think that's, there's like a, probably a lot of good ways to make that that choice, um, and you may choose. Like I think the other thing that always for me is really I think has been really surprising, and I think surprises a lot of people is that how much people like different ages of their kids is really variable, right? So like I you hmm. know like I didn't I didn't like love sorry Jenny I didn't love having a baby like I didn't no need to apologize <laughs> I, I did, but, you know it's like basically when i like you know i started going back to work like pretty quickly particularly after the second kid and like and you know i like i, I like like of course they're great and like they're and they're sort of physically they need they need you a lot but i kind of never i i and i but i just it wasn't like my favorite phase you know and and i also didn't have any of the patience for it right so it was sort of like the I remember this thing where my we had this really wonderful nanny with my second kid and she like he didn't like to nap in the crib. And like she if but he would nap like for two and a half hours if you just like sat and held him. Like 
going to fucking sit and help my baby for two and a half hours. Are you kidding me? I'm busy. And so like when it was, when I was in charge and like some people love this, like when I was in charge, I would like wait until I fell asleep and then I would put him down and he'd like wake up immediately. But I was just like, oh, I'm just going to go like do something for five minutes. She was like, I love sitting with him. I'm just, she would just like sit there in a chair. For like, and I was like, you know what? This is the person who should be doing this because it's like, I'm just doing something else. Well, that is like a true delegation of like, of like, yeah. of like, of skills to let. <laughs> and yeah. they're like, but I think yeah. that I think part of the key, and I'm I'm like actually very grateful for my to my mother for this, is that I didn't feel guilty. For that. Like I didn't. I think some people will be like, you know what? This means I'm like a like. Like I should be enjoying every minute. I should, you know, but like oh, yeah. I did like I was just like I was like, yeah, seems like Becky's doing a great job. She's sitting there having a great time. She <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to my office. But now uh, I really allocation love, now of I'm resources. like totally into my kids and I like spend and I spend way more time with them than I think sort of many people do in my kind of professional situation. And so it's like a little bit of a I cannot yeah. tell you how much this was exactly my week last week. <laughs> it's almost verbatim. And it's just like, I have things that I need to do or busy. want to do. And it just, yeah. it, it, it's, you, I, I, the guilt part is the challenging thing. And I do think that a lot of um, the, the issues that come up are everyone makes their decision. And since it's such a deeply personal decision to them, they're defensive of that choice. And when they're presented with another option, they attack it rather than say, okay, well, that's not what worked for me. And yeah. I want to be right. And I want to be so right that it's right for everybody, not just right for me. And it's very hard to train yourself to be like, you know what? Like maybe it's not right for other people. And that makes us assholes. I, it, all, I, my, it also translates to COVID a little bit too. Yeah, so I true. was actually going to say that. So yeah. true. But Scott, go ahead. You were about to say something. So, so, um, I mean, there's so many things to say, and the thing is, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to compete here in terms of the childcare business. Though I was, I mean, I didn't birth my kids, um, but, but I was um, a, a 50 50 parent. I mean, like really took it very seriously but i will say now pe people are shocked when i say it but i think from zero to ten is a net negative <laughs> that is that is i really think that they they there's great joy but they are worth they are cost more than they're worth um a after 10 it, it like i find it's like a huge like they they like i'm so I'm, I'm definitely super happy that I had them after they turned 10. Genevieve, <laughs> I will say I have I have seen it as more or less just as just an uphill, like since since birth. I would say like the first two weeks were better than like weeks two to eight. But then after that, it was like pretty much just an increase. Thank um, you for that. Yeah, I, I can't believe you're doing this I, at this phase with my first kid, I have to say this was the time that I sat on the couch in the basement and cried and thought I would never feel rested again. <laughs> I mean, to, to the credit of his dad and also just the people around me, I'm very lucky. But the other thing is too, and Kate and I talked about this as a person, it was very important to me that I still felt like me and I didn't feel like me right after. And that was a very scary thing. And mm -hmm. so to try and get back to feeling like me is a priority. <laughs> yes. Totally. I think that's so healthy to realize. Um, so I, so, okay. So everyone's kind of mentioned something, so I'm going to kind of bring it together, which is kind of pivot us a little bit to the COVID stuff, um, which is kind of about like Liberty and again, to like signaling and to choice making, which is kind of just to say that like, um, there is, oh my God, what is the thing that you, what is like the cognitive bias that you have of basically like, um, affirmation bias is it affirmation bias where you basically like whatever you have chosen you think it is the right choice for others or like you yeah it's like right Isn't that affirmation bias. Like, sometimes I think of it as like cognitive dissonance like I want yes I mean it's some it, I mean all of these things we just like to give them names they're all the same thing yeah and I've seen like a very psychologist I said that okay <laughs> it's okay <laughs> but like I do think that like from a from a from a it was fascinating as someone who I work in free speech a lot and like a, like as a lawyer in a rights-based framework to hear rights language come in to the conversation, to liberty choices come into the conversation around COVID and to have them 
like to have the emotional mantle of both like it's a public health disaster and don't tell me how to raise my children which i feel are like these like very very rights based very like choice based architectures for balancing like utilitarian arguments in a lot of different ways and like things like that and so i'm just kind of very curious if you thought about it that way or seen that or like what you kind of what kind of structure you put around watching these battles like take place yeah i mean i think there there's a huge there's a huge amount of overlap in the way that people sort of talk about these things and the kind of like virtue the sort of virtue signaling aspects of some of these some of the things and and you know in 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 pregnancy or in parenting there can be this feel of like the sort of more you're sacrificing, the better parent you are, that like it is the act of sacrifice itself that is making you a good parent. Not that, so like, you know, if like, like I breastfed my, I mean, this is not true of me, but like this sort of like, I breast my kid, breastfed my kid for two years. And like, it is the fact that I did that. And I carried stuff through the airport, like that, like that's how I show that I'm a good parent. I think that comes up, that comes up a lot. Um, I think in some ways it's sort of there's a there's a parallel in COVID, which is like the more lo and particularly on sort of one side of the aisle, like the kind of more lockdown that I was and the less I did, that's how I show that I'm like a like a good per person and that I'm and I, I think where it where where the analogy breaks down is that the that you know particularly particularly early on there was this sort of sense in which like okay actually you are sacrificing for other people in a way. And there's like a sort of societal, there's like a societal benefit in a way that there's not with breastfeeding, right? Like your, you know, your choice to breastfeed or not is not about whether somebody else is going to get COVID, you know, going to get COVID. And your choice to do things in the world, go to Thanksgiving or whatever it is, does have that kind of overlap. And I think that made the, that sort of gave a, a kind of weight to the virtual signaling that kept, like that, that made it that made it slightly different, but I think it still had the same feel. And I think if anything, the the parallel has gotten stronger in the sort of post-vaccine era, because I think it's much, it, now in some ways it, it isn't so much, uh, like it is, your choices have much less of an impact on other people now that everybody is, can, you know, can be vaccinated if they, if they choose to be. And so I think there's now the sort of, ar like the argument you see on the kind of, on the, on the political right around like, you know, look, like if you choose, you know, choose, you know, your right to choose to get vaccinated or not and like now i now like the the argument for individualism is much stronger and then you get into this kind of sort of virtue signaling piece being very important i don't know that's don't kind know. of how I, that's kind of how i see some of that i don't want to get too technical here but i know you're like really deep into the data and i just really want to ask i'm sorry taking us a little off course but i was just wondering do you, based on the data and all the current do the vaccines work? Absolutely. Are you serious? He's joking. That's I'm just, I, was just, I, was, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to say yes to podcasts, and I don't know what they'll be about. <laughs> just freaking out our guests. <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway, I, I just, I mean, what is the, what is the, I mean, like, obviously, um, the, the, the way I got to that insane question, I was just, like, thinking, like, how, like, you're you're like you love walking into minefields right like like talk about you know talk about like parenting like is there a is there a bigger minefield than that and then you talk about covid right um which of course is like this huge thing and and you were very you were um you came out very um uh, uh I, early as i as i remember questioning um, um, school closures and things like that. Was it really difficult? Uh, is it, I mean, do you have like the thickest skin imaginable or like, how do you deal with, with, with this or does it get to you? Um, I don't have a very thick skin. I have really? a very short memory, I think is, is probably, I mean, I think my skin has thickened a lot over the last year, just because this sort of like the, the kind of vitriol and anger around the COVID school stuff is so has been so much greater than anything on any of like sort of anything on any of the books and partly because I'm like sort of more public and partly because just like I can't believe how people feel about this but um but I think one of the things is I just forget like I just for, like I feel terrible 
And then like 20 minutes later, I just like forget how bad I felt about that. And then I just like go and, and do it um, and, and do it again, which is like, I think that's, that's it. It's just a short memory. It's wow. Okay. Yeah. That's I, amazing. That, that is really amazing. I, I should, I, I, I should not worry about like, um, drinking too much or something, how, how, it, how it will affect my, my I was cognitive just say, It's like an evolutionary advantageous trait for <laughs> like someone in your position. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, there's a beautiful, I, there's a, be I'm not, uh, yeah, there's a beautiful line in the Bible which says where God complains and he says, I gave you the greatest gift, which is the gift of forgetting and you use it against me. Um, I, like there's a, there, there is Are you that. Kidding? serious i can't tell. <laughs> no, no no that's a real, that's a real it, it is no it's it's it, it is i mean there would be a weird thing to make up about the bible okay um, true. <laughs> yeah, but, but but this idea that you can like like you know it bothers you but for 20 minutes and then you're like onto something else that's 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 really quite adaptive i mean i think the thing about the school stuff is um is that I kept I kept going on that more even though it was like you know even with the forgetting that was still like really like that was pretty emotionally costly and I pushed on that because I thought it was right um and because I felt like basically unlike you know telling pregnant women they can have sushi which was definitely right but also like okay you know like if people don't have sushi you know like if I faced the kind of vitriol I faced about opening schools in COVID around like sushi and pregnancy, I would just like, forget it. You know what? Like, yeah. do, do have your sushi, don't have your sushi, like NBD. Um, but I think on the school stuff, it felt like, okay, like actually we are screwing, you know, there's like a bunch of kids who are like, there are a bunch of poor kids who are not getting to go to in-person school and are in like terrible home situations because we are not opening schools. And if I have any, if there's any sense in which being yelled at on Twitter from me, like you know extremely privileged professor like if i can move that needle at all that is worth it because who cares how much people yell at me on twitter like my life is going to be fine this is why scott picks fights with rick grinnell so yeah, no, me, that's like, a, that's <laughs> a, that's a, it's the right thing to do yeah exactly because yeah. it's the right thing to do my uh -oh. oh go ahead gdf from what you've seen though so far so it, it, from my perspective and to be very transparent for the past couple of weeks have been a blur, but it also is one of those things that it just seems like the conversations around schools and how we run them and how we should ha handle the pandemic are escalating in tensions and frustrations. And it just seems to be ever increasing. From what you've looked at, do you see opportunities where people can come together and perhaps de-escalate the situation and kind of provide like multiple avenues or multiple methods of a way to manage this as a public health thing and a liberty issue? I think it's really hard. I mean, in, in, in some ways I am trying to be like positive because I think there have been, there has been progress, like relative to where we were a year ago, like basically everybody is at school, you know, like all of the kids have, they, you know, they're not all there, but like everybody has access to in-person schooling. That was not true. That's actually like really good. I think people are so on edge and so tired and like, and there has so much decision fatigue and it's gotten so polarized that all of these sort of auxiliary questions about schools, like, should we have masks? How should we think about vaccinating kids? Whatever, like, you know, have gotten just really, really like a, like a lot. Um, and I think that that's bad and is difficult to is very difficult to to de-escalate because it's become in some of the like the masks are the most this the masking has become the most polarized thing in a way that i cannot understand because it it's not that important either direction like i'm i'm sorry like it's not that protective it's not that big a deal like it, neither of those things, like neither the cost nor the benefits are especially large. They are probably neither of them is, is zero, but it's like of a thing to kind of be like so deeply engaged. I mean, there's people who are like, basically seem to think a mask is like a titanium shield. And yeah. then people who think like, if your kid is wearing a mask, like they're going to pass out from not being able to breathe and they'll never yeah. learn anything. And those things are both wrong. You yeah. know, it's just like, it's probably like a little bit protective and particularly in high prevalence areas. And probably it's like a little bit harder to learn to read in the end, that's kind of it. 
Do you think it comes back to that virtue signaling or just the signaling of the mask itself and why it, it's become such a eruptive topic? Yeah, I think it is. It is a virtue signaling. It's like I think it's also like a, a sort of in group out group kind of where it's like basically like I don't I don't I want to like once everyone is saying this, then I like want to be in with the people who are saying this. Um you know, and I also think it's it's tricky because there's a sort of school versus elsewhere kind of distinction, which is like there are like it makes a tremendous amount of sense to wear uh, masks like on public transit um, because that's like where you get get stuff, you know. And so and it makes much more sense for adults to wear it in some kinds of settings. So there's like a sort of balance that we should be getting to that's somewhere between like two year olds need to wear a mask at at preschool, which isn't, probably doesn't make very much sense. And like people should wear a mask on the subway, which like probably does make um, does make sense just because you won't get other stuff. Yeah, um, I was going to say that this reminds me a lot when people were just starting to get vaccinated. Um, one of our guests came on the show and he had had, had hats made that said uh, like just vaccinated. And, uh, and, um, and it, like, and that's why he was, you know, cause it's the, like, it was just starting to be this, like, you didn't have to wear a mask if you were double vaccinated yeah or, and I just thought that that was like, so interesting that like, like it, it was, it was unclear which tribe you were on. If you were, if you just weren't wearing a mask, like you could be one of those jerks and you have to like still try to signal things. So you're going to just like put it on another piece of clothing. Like, and like kind of stick it out there. I just thought it was super interesting. Um, no, that is we should, um, yeah, we should go to like, we, well, we should go to questions that Scott was going to ask you. Well, um, oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to, I mean, it, it, it's, you, you, yeah, you have, you have a new book out called The Family Firm. Can you just kind of uh, give us um, uh, just a thumbnail sketch to, to, so that we can generate some sales here? Yeah, so the new book is uh, about parenting in the sort of early school years, like five to 12. There's a lot of data around school choice and around like sleep and nutrition and a bunch of kinds of extracurricular screens, sort of things that we think about. There's also a huge, like a sort of half of the book is basically about decision making and life structures and actually trying to like help people say like, hey, at, you know, once your kids get into school, there's gonna be a lot of like logistics and you're going to want to think more carefully than I think we often do about um, about what you want your life to look like, about what you want your your kind of day to day to to be. Um, and so there's a bunch of tools for people to use there, and some t talk about decision decision structures and kind of how you can. I mean, the, could the pitch of the book is like manage your family a little bit more like a farm, um, where it's not it's not like you know profit maximize your your kids or something weird like that, but rather that like when you make decisions as a firm, you like think about what the downstream effects are. And then if you choose to, I don't know, uh, if you choose to, like if you decide to have family, it is important to you to have family dinner every night, that's gonna, that's gonna restrict some other things that you wanna do. And conversely, if you like accidentally commit to travel soccer, but actually it was really important to you to have family dinner, like you're screwed. And so you need to think about that upfront that those are really one decision, not not two decisions and that's that's kind of the pitch what what is the kind of when you were writing the book what was the one kind of intervention that you found like the most interesting or surprising um i mean i think the most compelling so the two pieces of the two things i really like are one the data on sleep so there's like just so much good evidence that sleep is like incredibly important for kids and even that it um and for adults um, but that, but that like even sort of moving a, an hour, um, like moving your, moving kids sleep an hour for a week, like affects their behavior, affects their performance on tests. Like it's just like all kinds of like sleep is just like so much more important than we are doing. And I think there's this, this tendency for people to be like, I'm going to smash more stuff in like more math tutoring. But like, if your kid is not awake, like math tutoring is like no good. Um, so that's kind of one thing. And then there's like some very interesting stuff about reading, um, which is like, uh, which is like, just like how kids learn to read and the fact that like, basically you need to, um, you need to use phonics. Like phonics is like so important. Phonics is, is just really important. Yeah. So much I am. Um, go ahead, Scott. No, 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 no. I, I that, that, that's, I, 
that's that was great thank you yeah um so about the sleep thing i was just going to mention like have you worked with the brown well, at least when i was there the brown sleep lab was quite excellent it um, is excellent yes yeah he does a lot of lots of my friends got paid money to go to sleep uh can i go do that paid. Yeah, we have a lot of, there's like tons of adult sleep research, which is like basically if you keep adults awake all night or college, you do it with college students, obviously, keep college students awake all night and then you give them these tests and like they think that tests, that they do better, but actually they do worse, which is like kind of my favorite. Thing. That's what I mean, like a lot of this actually, like a lot of what you're describing also strikes me as like correlative to like the diagnosing of certain types of like developmental, like things like ADD and things like that in children and then like putting them on stimulants and like, oh my God, shocker. If you treat them like fighter pilots, they will perform better if you give them stims. Like they will like, yes. they will actually like, you know, that like um, the people lose attention as they like are exhausted and kept on sleep schedules that were created for like factory, yeah, factory no, floor. We, and we see this in like you know when they uh, when they move like school start times, right? So a lot of the research on this in slightly older kids is when they move like high school start times later, kids sleep more, and it's like better for their school performance. But it's also like there are fewer car accidents, like when like these school districts like move the start time by forty five oh, minutes, like you don't have so as many car accidents. sleep is good that's is that like related to teenagers driving to school or is yeah. that like everyone it's really yeah it's related to teenagers driving to school or driving like you know beings like sleep deprived wow yeah tom mcguckin can, can so you nice guys hear you. me okay yep go ahead okay uh dr oster i'm a, a full disclosure i'm an economist uh i'm in new orleans right now trying to figure out a way to pay for three years of serial disasters of, as far as electrical utilities. But anyway, I watched you on, I, I think it was public TV one time, and you were talking about being ahead of the curve as far as a COVID-19. Um, COVID and one of the things I've noticed, and maybe I got you mixed up with somebody else, was that we didn't do a very good job of staying ahead of the disease. Now, maybe it's impossible, okay, with an exponentially infectious disease like this. But if you were to design a surveillance testing type of, of mechanism to give us warning when a disease outbreak is going to really affect a community, do you have any ideas about how that might work? You know, not... Not, not really. Um, I mean, I think that like there, you know, there are a bunch of like there are a bunch of people who've written like pretty thoughtful books about kind of how we could do this, um, how we could have been better organized. I think there were like a thousand different failures and like the so many failures and the government was not really in a position. There was like nobody whose job I mean, I say like the problem is like nobody's job was to fix this. There were just like a lot of different random people who were like kind of weighing in and we made a lot of big mistakes in data and like my i mean my thing is data like i think some of the biggest mistakes we have made are not having enough information early on that would tell us like what choices we should have been doing and which lockdowns were useful and which lockdowns were not useful and you know getting some like sort of sense of where things were i mean antigen testing is like the like a huge epic shit show and the idea that like still 19 months in like we are not doing like we do not have access to, to antigen testing that's like that's a huge mistake so there's just like so many failures like that and i think that the answer is like it's not so much i i guess i will say i'm a little worried that i think people are going to infer that like the solution that we need is to invest a lot in um in like some kind of like secret sciencey like like some secret science thing where we're going to like like detect early strains of the flu in some way and then we're not going to in invest in like organizing our government in a way that would allow them to like react in somewhat more real time to this no it reminds me of a numeracy issue frankly like like a, like an over rotation on statistics and like science that is like not reflect like this is one of the reasons that they were like didn't want to release the Delta numbers or more information about Delta and things like that was like, right. Is that like from a public health standpoint, people like 
freak out when they hear numbers and completely don't know how to put them in context of their actual risk. And so um, it's paternalistic, but I mean, I think that that's, I think that I mean, I wanted to ask really quickly, um, first of all, I want to say that you should, if you're not and don't already know Dana Goldstein, um, she was in my class at Brown um, and is amazing and writes about- Dana wrote a profile of my school stuff this this uh, summer. So yeah, I know Dana. Oh, great. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, and then the other thing that I was going to say was that um, I was curious what you think about the role of schooling. Um, and one in particular, I'm thinking of Brian Kaplan as it changes through time. Sorry, I should have finished that sentence first. Um, so K through 12 versus like how it, so Brian Kaplan, the economist, George Mason has written an interesting book about homeschooling and homeschooling his children and basically like putting them through AP tests in US history and them getting fives at like, you know, at like, you know, maybe they don't like play well with others or like, I don't know, like whatever the trade-offs are for that, fine. Like I think there probably are some, but it does raise a lot of really interesting points. Not just like, I don't really want to get into tracking or whatever, but just like the role that kind of came out in COVID of like K through six and as a socialization function or as childcare primarily. And then like six through eight being a, like something else. And then like nine through 12 being something different. And I just was kind of curious what your thoughts were on that. I mean, I, I think that for me, like one of the things that we learned is that school, there is so much being delivered by school that has nothing to do with learning, right? And there's gonna be a lot of like in this sort of post COVID like re, discussion of like what we did what we did wrong around schools there is going to be a lot of focus on the question of like you know okay what like like how much learning loss is there and how many points did people lose in math and it's going to be enormously large numbers of of points and so on but actually like i think in the end the sort of the the bigger losses are going to be associated with the parts of school that have nothing to do with how much math you do right and and i think in some ways the reason you can see that is that there are these huge losses for for kids even who have tremendous amounts of resources right and like what are we like what are kids learning in school they're learning to like yeah they're learning to read but they're also learning to um you know they're learning to like interact with other other people and to solve conflicts and to deal with the the sort of life of being a of being a, a person and for me this was like a personally like a huge a huge pandemic realization because you know my kids when when we sort of went into lockdown the spring of 2020 my kids were in the third grade and the and pre-k and i was like okay this is a great opportunity to like brian kaplan and them up like you know i'm gonna do like we're gonna learn so many things we're gonna like and you know in some ways that was they're gonna be like awesome. speaking literal greek by the end of the <laughs> and in some ways like in some ways that was like very successful you know i like by the time like my we got to the fall with my kid he was like you know, reading at a third grade level in kindergarten. Like, you know, like I really taught him to read. Like I used a book, it was called How to Teach a Kid to Read in 100 Easy Lessons. It wasn't that bad. Like we did the 100 Easy Lessons, you know, it is, but like, it was the worst. Like I achieved the thing that I wanted and it, what I achieved was terrible because the thing is they were just like really like unhappy and it wasn't, you know, they learned all of these things, but actually the socialization as aspects of being at school, like when they got back to school, it was like, oh, oh my God, like I, and. And then, you know, I was like, I don't care what they, you know, I don't care what they're learning. Like, I just want them to like, you know, learn to kind of manage in, in society. And I think that was a, that was an experience that some people, um, that, you know, some people, some people shared. And so I, I think we're, and I think we're just like learning a lot about what school is doing. For different people. For like different I, people. No one is going to be surprised at this. I loved reading books and like, but I loved school for socialization and talking to my teachers. Like I like loved it. That was my like, hands down my favorite part. <laughs> and like my partner, uh, super smart guy, very like went to a great college. Like he, like if he could have just taught himself all of like taught himself all of applied mathematics, like up until, you know, like in, you know, he would just would have, he would have done it. And then he would have gone for like long runs. Like that's like the, like, the type of, like, so we're just, totally different structures but you know there was probably some good out of box stuff for both of us i think that that is like you kind of sound like you take a very micro approach microeconomics approach to kind of like thinking about this like in terms of like how 
almost like delegation of resources to certain types of like people and like, like kind of splitting up like labor or like where it's best spent in certain ways. Or do, do you kind of, would you say like, not exactly? No, I think that's, I mean, I, th- I think that's fair. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, yeah, I think, I think I, we, you know, we look for efficiencies. So what happens when you grow up in a household full of economies. Can, can, can I ask whether you, this is somewhat personal question, so you don't have to answer, but um, do you feel like this emphasis on um, efficiency and data is a way of controlling your own anxiety? That yes. is, okay, okay. For sure, yeah. No, 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 I mean, yes, I think it's like, there was a, there was a moment one time when, so the titles of my books have things like, you know, a data-driven guide to better, more relaxed parenting, and it's like a lot of people <laughs> were relaxed. And and somebody nothing screams relaxation like, to me like data. Yeah, <laughs> and somebody once at a party was like, was like, ah, oh, your books, are like, you know, I feel I, like I feel so much more relaxed. Like you must be like the most relaxed parent. Like, and my husband was like, my husband, he just like couldn't, he just like, couldn't hold it. And he was like, I don't think you're the most relaxed person standing on that small piece of like asphalt. <laughs> No, and I think it is. I mean, I think for me, there's a huge amount of of sort of like control of anxiety that is de- like a, like alleviation of anxiety that is like delivered by the by the control. And I think that's part of what I found so difficult about the pandemic. To be frank, is that like basically there's a realization of like there's a lot of stuff you can't um, you can't you know you can't control. And I I I wrote about this once like the, the sort of a low point of this in the in the winter where it kind of felt like just like there were a million things like I wanted a vaccine I wanted to know the kids could stay in school I want like I wanted I want I want like all these things that like I just had no control over and I I got really into my like backyard ice rink in this sort of like like that was the thing I could do was like make the ice rink like really nice um and it was it sort of led to like just being outside in like the 10 degree weather like (laughs) sprayer like 12 times a day because like it, it was just like that was what I could that was what I could do and and it was just yeah, it was really hard. Thank you for answering. I just want to apologize because various people pointed out that that by asking you about anxiety, that was a HIPAA violation. So I yeah, oh yeah, so. yeah. I did. Wow, lots of that is like such a law school. Like that. Okay, it's cool. We're very we're very, we're, we're very uh, meticulous about the law on this show. Okay, fine. We like barely know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like yeah, three like, I, 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 I don't even know whether HIPAA is two A's or two P's. I really... I'm not going to tell you just to screw you up, Scott. <laughs> like, like, give you a complex about it. Um, but no, seriously, I Scott got became an expert at Twitter. I got had like an amazing, insane tomato garden. That was like every rainbow of tomato. I grew all of these tomatoes from seed. And it was like I would go out every day and pick at the tomato plants. Like literally, it was just like something to do. And it was like felt much more productive, frankly, than like spinning in my head about things I could never figure out. Genevieve made a baby. Yeah. Right. That was, that is somewhat (laughs) more productive. But I mean, to be fair, my ice rink was really nice. Um, But I bet your baby is nicer. (laughs) He's good. He's okay. I'm blunt. I'm I'm very biased. So I I refrain from judgment. Well, that's also, I'm also very biased about my ice rink. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay david bots for the last semi unrelated question if i can bring you in david it's like not letting me oh there you are oh hello oh lloyd I thought that was like this a is luke. luke says hi luke, hi, luke. Hi, luke. oh yeah i have luke forgotten um well dr oster uh thank you so much for being here i will tell you kate clonic promised when you came on the show she promised the sun moon and stars and you surpassed all of her superlatives. Aww. So I was very excited family. to have you on. <laughs> it's true. She went on and on, and now now we all know why. So, um, uh, what is your thoughts, or do you have thoughts about inflation? There's people who are freaked out, and oh, inflation is just going to be so terrible. Um, do you see it as being uh, a blip, or? more uh more long term you know 
after that introduction, I feel like this is gonna be disappointing, um, but I don't really know anything about the macro economy. Um, and so I could tell, like, I, I don't, this, this is like one of those- Oh, I love, a, I love a null result. No, please. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, like, it's not, it's, it's sort of, it's so interesting in academia because you get so siloed and like, actually like, like there is a sort of whole field of economics and like, I'm a professor in that, but like, honestly, like, I mean, and I could tell you like what Larry Summers thinks about, you know, thinks about inflation. He thinks it's going to be a problem, I think. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and my dad is a macroeconomist and he said he thought it would be a problem. So th that's kind of what I got for you, but like, I, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's just really, it's, it's sort of really, I also think to be fair or not fair to macroeconomists, they also probably don't, like this is a really hard thing to to predict, um, particularly because you want to use like past data to predict. It's like, well, what like what past data could I use? Uh, you know. So what I'm hearing is it's very similar to the Supreme Court and how they're going to rule on cases. Exactly. <laughs> we really, you don't like go. It's like, I don't know. You know, <laughs> no. it could be anything. Yeah. So this is like yeah. about supply chains. I just got it, like before this call, I got an email from somebody that was like can you come be on CNN to talk about supply chains? I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, everything I know about that, I've already learned from the CNN website. Like, <laughs> oh God, it is amazing. I wish people would talk more about how they ask to be go to go on shows or like, I, like I've written a number of op-eds in the New York Times this point. And like, I just wrote a little like tweet about how they like tried three times to change my headline to like something like I was inside Facebook. And so I, I'm like, no, don't write that. That's going to be misleading. Don't, don't say that. And you can like, but there are like the media organizations just like kind of want you to come on for three and a half minutes and not everyone that you see on TV knows necessarily what they're talking about. So that is, yeah. that is yeah, I, I know it's really hard. I never get asked to go on TV ever, ever. I, I don't think I've ever been asked. Well, at the next um, legality panel. Do you know anything about uh, supply chains? Because <laughs> CNN is looking for someone to comment on that. And um, not me. No, I, I don't know anything about supply chains, so that's fair. Um, but I, 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 I would say that there are lots of kind of jurisprudential debates that were they to be of interest to anyone, I think I could talk about. But I, but nobody ever asks me to go on like, oh, oh, you do this. Why don't you talk about this? They don't even do that. They don't even that make that mistake. So I think the reason for that, not to like get too into it, the reason for that is the way that these guys decide who will be on their shows is just like people that occur to them, which is why like basically yeah. these people are like, are there any economists that I've heard of? Oh, there's that lady who writes that weird newsletter. Like she seemed, <laughs> I think she said she was an economist. Maybe she knows about supply chains. I'll write to her because she's an email I can find. I see. Okay, but so so basically, my what you're telling me is that I should occur to people. Uh, that's that's the that's my advice. You okay, should have heard okay. it here first, Scott. Okay, I'm gonna it's I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that. Thank you very much. Of yes, course, we would welcome. like you to tweet your local news station and make them aware of Scott Shapiro so that we yeah. can have. Yeah. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> could be on like W whatever is like the New Haven like you know yeah. covering the New Haven Register or whatever is the uh... yeah, exactly. they're going to be so disappointed when they find out he lives in the West Village. Yeah, right. Or what? What, 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 what do you think is going to happen with inflation? I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> sorry, that's not my. It's going to get bigger. But I was yeah. going to, or smaller, or the, something. Just say zero lower bound. That's There's a, very, a different jargon. That's a that very jargony thing inflation. about inflation. See, I'm really, I'm just really concerned about the zero lower bound. Well, yeah. I, I do know you don't want to be in a deflationary spiral. That that's right? probably yeah. I mean, that's not, that does sound bad because it, it could get you to the zero bad. lower bound. Uh, <laughs> I I, I would that? say stop it. I feel like this is like turning into exclusive legal negativism. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, but seriously, Emily, this was amazing. You're hilarious um, and wonderful to talk to. Um, we're not gonna have you on again before we have your parents. Uh, and then we're gonna ask some HIPAA violation questions about you <laughs> and what you were like as a kid. Um, but uh no seriously this was this was this like really it fun. was it was really it's, it's not too bad right i told it you it was just great. Be like a normal conversation it's like a this good is, time 
extremely fun. It was when we had really nothing to do. This really was like it was pretty. It was it was a decent substitute for fun. I totally. <laughs> I totally <agree. laughs> um, that substitute not complimentary goods. Look it up, people. Um, the <laughs> we will be back twenty three minutes and oh no wait. 23 hours, sorry, I really screwed that up. 23 hours and 56 minutes from now. And with Paul Rosenzweig, American attorney, um, partner at R Street. And he's going to be talking to us. Oh, I think he's going to be playing Where's the Lie. Um, so that will be fun. Uh, and uh, we're not allowed to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we're allowed to find our weird little pandemic projects. And then, you know, just obsess over them and pick at them and spray them until we're totally normal and acceptable to go out into society again. 